Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is Code Pink's weekly webinar of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We air every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink's YouTube channel. Today, we have the great honor and privilege of talking with Francisco Campbell. He's the Nicaragua ambassador to the United States, and he is talking with us today from the embassy here in DC. So welcome, Mr. Ambassador. I'm so pleased you accepted our invitation to speak today, particularly on the heels of the 25th uh, birthday of Augusto Sandino. 125th birthday. Yesterday. That's correct. Or yes. Tuesday, I should say. We're recording on, on Tuesday. We're going to air on Wednesday. So Tuesday, yes. So really perfect timing to be in conversation with you. Um, before I start um, our conversation, I'd like to tell you, as well as our audience, um, that a number of solidarity groups um, have partnered with us today to broadcast this webinar. Um, Alliance for Global Justice, Friends of the ATC Nicaragua, Friends of Latin America here in Washington, D.C., and the Chicago ALBA Solidarity Committee. So thank you to all four of those organizations. And then, of course, a huge personal thank you uh, to Jerry Condon, former president of Veteran for Peace, uh, for introducing the two of us and encouraging you to accept the invitation to speak with us today. So thank you, Jerry. Um, now also, uh, just to remind, just as we said, uh, the, the 18th was the 125th birthday of Augusto Sandino, and um, we'll talk this afternoon about the importance of his legacy to uh, Nicaragua. I'd like to kind of um, outline our conversation for the audience and let the audience know that you can email me. We're recording this um, webinar on Tuesday the 19th, and we will broadcast to all of you on Wednesday from Code Pink's YouTube channel. And so there will not be a live chat, chat but if you have uh, questions, comments, you can email me at terry, T-E-R-I, at codepink.org, and we will attempt to um, judiciously respond to, to questions you may have regarding um, issues brought up today in today's conversation. So first of all, Let's have the ambassador tell a little bit about his personal history. I think all of you will find his personal story very compelling and very inspirational, particularly for us activists. And then um, we'd like to talk about um, how he has um, lived through the Sandinista revolution, how he personally has benefited from the revolution as well as the entire nation, um, different forms of US intervention in Nicaragua, um, over the last hundred plus years. And then let's also talk about how the government or how the revolution and its philosophy of governing has allowed um, Nicaragua to respond to COVID-19. So, so welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So let's start with your personal, with your personal history, because you have such a wonderful, inspiring story to share with all of us. Well, I am from the uh, Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. That's a part of the country uh, where you find indigenous people, mm -hmm. people of, uh, of African descent. And um, as I said, I, I was born there. I grew up there. Then I, I came to the US in, in 1967 to study. After I finished my education, I returned to Nicaragua and uh, became involved after a while in the revolutionary struggle. When the uh, revolution came to power in 1979, I began to work on the Caribbean coast of the country, which was very exciting for me because it, was an, it gave me an opportunity to take to the region uh, my uh, education, my abilities, my experiences, and um, we were able to, um, uh, in effect, um, begin to uh, set the groundwork for a real genuine integration of the Caribbean coast into the political life of Nicaragua uh, as a whole. Um, in 1982, I was, um, I was, uh, 
assigned to work at the Nicaragua Embassy here in Washington. And I, um, I worked primarily with solidarity groups um, and as well as with the, the US Congress. I was a political affairs officer at the embassy at the time, which um, was very, a very important moment because we had the Reagan administration Wow. with counter-revolutionary counter um, war, trying to over, overthrow the Sandinista revolution. And I, I believe that the American People Solidarity Movement played a very important role in, in, in stopping the more aggressive expression of the uh, Reagan hostility towards mm -hmm. the Sandinista popular, um, popular revolution. What a lot of people don't remember and I think it's important to point it out, is that in 1986, Nicaragua took the United States to the International Court of Justice and charged the United States with uh, promoting uh, uh, terrorism against the Nicaraguan people. The, the, Nicara the, the International Court of Justice found the United States guilty and demanded that the United States pay Nicaragua restitution for all the damage done uh, in, uh, in uh, trying to overthrow the, uh, the, the, the Nicaragua government. The destruction of, uh, of uh, port facilities, uh, oil storage tanks, the killing of uh, Nicaraguan, innocent Nicaraguan citizens. Mm -hmm. And the world court found that the United States was guilty of state sponsored terrorism and ordered the United States to pay Nicaragua $17 billion in compensation, restitution. Wow. The United States has so far failed <laughs> to comply with the ruling of the court and on the contrary, now is undertaken to impose economic sanctions against the Nicaragua government, trying to um, once again destroy what the revolution has been able to build, uh, better opportunities for education for the Nicaraguan people, better health care, trying to promote uh, policies that would eliminate uh, poverty in, in, in the country, and in effect trying to de destroy the participatory democracy that we are trying to build in Nicaragua that incorporates indigenous people, people of African descent, women, campesinos, all those sectors of the Nicaragua society that were excluded and marginalized in the past are now participating actively in the building of a Nicaragua, a Nicaragua model that responds to the hopes, the dreams and aspiration of the, of the Nicaraguan people. That is what the U.S. sanctions are designed to do, to try to destroy what we have accomplished through great sacrifice and commitment of the Nicaraguan people. You know, we're seeing this, you know, across the hemisphere, across the globe. There's basically this financial starting, and I would argue here in the United States as well, and, it, and Washington, D.C., where you and I both live, is a real microcosm of those populations that are really disadvantaged and, and not um, on par participating in what is becoming a more and more privatized economy. And you see this system of using sanctions as this form of warfare as really basically financially starving the Nicaraguan government and others of being able to provide a public or state um, infrastructure and institutions for all people. And it is, it is really important for U.S. citizens to understand this as a form of hybrid warfare, just find well, this financial starvation. It's not hybrid warfare, it, it is, is warfare. <laughs> it is war. Yeah. It is warfare because it destroys, it seeks to create uh, instability, it seeks to demoralize, and it has one purpose in mind, trying to overthrow governments that refuse to bend to the dictates of neocolonialist uh, ambition. It, 
In the United States, there are sectors that refuse to recognize that our countries have a right to develop a system, a model that responds to the, the hopes and aspiration of our people, a right to make the right decisions for ourselves. And that in order to be able to do that, we need, we need to have a model in place that is specifically designed to overcome the difficulties, the many problems is that we have in our society that are a result of colonialism and neo-colonialism, problem of poverty, the, proper, the problem of not having access to education, the problem of not having access to adequate uh, healthcare, the poverty that afflicts our countries, those are the things that needs to be eradicated. And we are trying to accomplish that and have made very important gains by establishing a model that we uh, refer to as a participatory democracy that ensures that sectors of the society previously excluded and marginalized are now effective and active participants in the construction of a new Nicaragua, a Nicaragua that responds to the hopes and aspiration of the majority poor. And we are making very, very important progress. Um, when President Ortega came back to power in, uh, in, uh, in 2007, he immediately began a policy of uh, national reconciliation and unity. The purpose being bringing together the various sectors of the Nicaraguan society, all committed to one overriding goal. And that goal was to fight against poverty. That has always been the priority of the Sandinista revolution. It has been a policy of President Daniel Ortega and we have made important uh, progress. However, sector, sectors in the United States and in Europe are trying to undo those important accomplishments. And of course, the Nicaraguan people will always, will always uh, stand up to those kinds of pressure, will always be willing to fight against any attempt to, um, to deny us the right to build a Nicaragua that responds to the needs of the Nicaraguan people. And so that is what this struggle is all about. When they talk about sanctions, they are basically saying, we want to demoralize, we want to destroy, we want to destabilize, and the sole purpose is to destroy the good things that we have accomplished. I have always said that when they look at the gains and the important progress that Nicaragua has made over the years, they see us as a bad example. <laughs> we, we, they see us as, as, as a bad example that other countries in other parts of the region might want to, uh, might want to emulate. But the truth of the matter is we, Nicaragua is committed to working towards the building of a just society, a society that really ensures that all sectors are able to participate. We want to get out of, of poverty through economic, through economic growth with yeah. social inclusion. That for us is the way to overcome poverty. And we were making tremendous uh, uh, strides ahead. In fact, for almost um, from 2007 to 2004 to 2018, we were, we were registering 5% annual GT, GDP growth. And that it was, was- It was some of the best, it was some of the largest growth in the hemisphere. That's uh, correct. Yeah. We, were, we were moving along in a very impressive way. And those sectors that cannot uh, accept that uh, a small country can in fact begin to, to move ahead in terms of bringing real benefit to its people, um, they, they felt threatened by these, these uh, big successes and they, under, they 
they decided to try to overthrow the government in a failed coup in 2018. They, they are talking about the um, human rights in Nicaragua when in fact all the Nicaraguan people did was to defeat the, the attempt by the, these, these, uh, these sectors to overthrow a duly elected government that was working and bringing good, great benefits to the people. You know, I think this is, gosh, you've mentioned a number of things I'd like us to expand on a bit. Um, I think this is one of the principal things um, the U.S. government uh, or, you know, that steady state that we seem to have regardless of how we vote, particularly since 1980, and, and a lot of U.S. citizens of all political stripes do not understand with countries such as Nicaragua, and I would also argue Cuba and Venezuela, that these gains that the governments have achieved for all people, you know, except those that look minority, extraordinarily wealthy, right-wing business class, um, that can't be undone. You know, this is a, um, people are, have received education, have received, uh, access to healthcare have grown economically and are fully engaged citizens, and that is something that that uh, many in the U.S. do not understand. And that evolution opening in society just and within people themselves just simply cannot be undone. Those achievements, and that I would argue that is in large part why the why the attempted coup of April 18th fail, just a complete misunderstanding of, of the ground, the people on the ground living in Nicaragua. You, you know, when we started our conversation, um, you uh, mentioned you are from the Caribbean coast uh, of uh, Nicaragua. And so can we talk a little bit about that? I have done um, work with the Garifuna community in Honduras and am familiar with the Mosquito population in Nicaragua. And indigenous people, and then these communities that are um, have a really unique historical legacy as part of I, how would you explain like the Garifuna part of this uh, slave trade, but escaped or formed their own um, communities after fleeing a, a, a sinking ship, I believe. Yes, is that the or is that more myth than it is? Oh, no, no, there, 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 <laughs> there, is, there, is some, there is some truth to that. The, um, the, the Nicaragua Caribbean coast, as I said earlier, has a very interesting history. In fact, um, the Nicaragua is the only country in Central America that was colonized by two powers. Spain colonized the, the Pacific side of the country and Great Britain uh, colonized the Caribbean side. Oh. Um, in fact, the Caribbean did not become a part of Nicaragua uh, until 1894. That's some, uh, some uh, almost 70 years uh, after Nicaragua, the Pacific side of the country, had received its uh, independence from Spain. And that is why um, there, there is this uh, um, difference in a way in the history of, of both regions of the, of the, of the country. Um, on the Caribbean side, you have uh, six uh, ethnic groups. You have the, uh, you have, uh, the Creoles, English speaking Creole. I am, uh, in Nicaraguan context, I am a, a Creole. Okay. Then you have the, um, the Miskitus, that, that's an indigenous group, probably the largest indigenous group in Nicaragua. Um, then you have the Sumo Mayagna, which is another indigenous group that is unique to Nicaragua. You will not find Mayagnas anywhere else in the world. And uh, then you have the Ramas, another indigenous group. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the Mestizos, and finally, the the, uh, the Garifonas. 
Uh, the, um, and the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua, you have people who uh, speak English, you have people who speak uh, Spanish, you have people who speak uh, uh, Miskitu, you have people who speak uh, Sumo Mayagna. The Gariponas, um, they lost their language and when the revolution came to power in, 19, uh, in 1979, one of the, one of the, uh, the, the items on our agenda was to encourage the uh, recovery of the Garifona language oh, on the wow. Caribbean coast. And in fact, we brought down uh, Garifonas from, uh, from uh, Belize and from Honduras who came down to Nicaragua and participated in the uh, uh, literacy campaign that took place in, the, in, the 19, in, in 1980 and 1981. And so um, we have a rich, multi-ethnic, multicultural society on the, uh, on the Nicaragua Caribbean coast in which the rights of uh, indigenous peoples and people of Afro, uh, Afro descendants um, are fully respected, including uh, the, re the return, recognition of their rights to a uh, communal property. This is a- very, Oh, wow, that's significant. This is a very important uh, development because under the Nicaragua uh, uh, legislation, those indigenous communities and Afro-descendant communities have received titles to their communal property. The total amount of land that was turned over to indigenous people and Afro-descendant people and the Nicaragua Caribbean coast um, was, is greater than the size of the Republic of El Salvador. Wow. That, that gives you an idea as to how much we have, uh, we have accomplished. Moreover, there are regional autonomous governments that are functioning on the Nicaragua, on the Nicaragua Caribbean coast. You have uh, the regional autonomous, autonomous council in the north, and you have the regional autonomous council on, in the south. These, these councils, they have the responsibility to ensure that the development of the natural resources of the region benefit the peoples of the, of the region. They, are in, they, they have the mandate to promote education and preservation of the culture of the indigenous people and Afro-descendant people of the region. And so we are, bring, we are putting together a comprehensive approach. In fact, we have even built uh, universities that are committed to the strengthening of the autonomy process in the region and that goes through the strengthening of identity and ensuring that people benefit from the proper use of the, of the natural resources in the region to benefit the people, the people of, the, of the region. So Nicaragua is building, and in fact, Nicaragua is the first country in the Americas that recognizes the multi-ethnic, multicultural makeup of its, uh, of its uh, of its society and has un undertaken to ensure effective participation of women as well as indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples in all levels of, of government. We are building a model that inevitably other countries in Latin America will want to emulate. We have had great successes we are moving ahead. And that again, yes. the, the, it's a threat. The, the sanctions are designed to destroy. They want to uh, deny the peoples of, of the region, deny the Afro-descendant people, deny the indigenous people, deny women, and deny the poor the right mm -hmm. to build a society that responds to their, to their needs and aspirations. I want to share um, just a personal anecdote with you. I think you might in, enjoy it. But I, I, this is, you know, the multi-ethnic Caribbean coast of Nicaragua is profoundly beautiful. Physic physically, the, the, the nature and the 
geology, just profoundly beautiful, as well as the people. The ethnic mix is just is profoundly beautiful and inspiring and really something for people to really, um, I would encourage to visit and, and honor that what's been created there and what, you know, and the attempt to preserve that, that mix of cultures and history. You were talking about um, how the how this Sandinista government has improved um, public infrastructure and institutions. And my last visit to Nicaragua was summer of 2016. And I was visiting um, a friend in Matagalpa, in Dario, actually. And we were on our, I was staying just outside of Managua, and I had gone out for a long weekend to visit um, her and her, and her then husband. And on the way back, the truck got a flat tire on that highway running between Matagalpa and Managua. And we sat there for a few minutes and um, a gentleman that um, owned and ran a yantaria down the street came along and just offered to, you know, take the tire off the car, ran it back to his, his shop and repaired it and brought it back and fixed it. I had a chance to take a photograph um, of his generosity and how, how um, the hospitality that was just so evident um, among uh, your, your um, fellow citizens. And I posted, it was, a, it was a photo taken from the rear of the truck looking at the gentleman repairing the tire for us and, and the road. And I posted it on Facebook and immediately started hearing from friends of mine who I have done uh, some solidarity work with in Honduras, they could not. What they weren't commenting on our flat tire and these two women who got stuck on the road. They were commenting on the condition of the road in the photograph. They could not believe, and I share this with the audience, the just how modern and beautifully paid the roads are particularly compared to the US-backed government and completely privatized economy of Honduras. They were beautiful roadways. And I would also share with our viewers that those roads are in rural communities as well. At least the principal road running through town, along with a primary, a primary school and, and, and a health clinic. Look, Nicaragua, over the last several years, have built what is recognized as the best roads in Latin America. In fact, we have accomplished an aspiration that for many years was out there and never achieved. And that is to build a road that links the Caribbean to the Pacific of the country. And not only one road. The first one that is now completed went from Managua to Bluefields on the Caribbean side of the country. The other road is going from Rama to Pearl Lagoon. And there is there's work going on right now to build a highway that will link the Pacific side of the country to Bilwi in Puerto Cabezas. Wow. Those, those have been historic aspiration of the people of Nicaragua as a whole, but especially the people of the Caribbean side of the country. And now it's not one road, it is, there are three <laughs> roads that are being built. The implications of that are extraordinary. It opens up to production areas of the country that previously were untapped. And so these strategic uh, initiatives that are coming to fruition set the foundation for Nicaragua to really, really develop. Remember I said, our strategy is promote economic growth with social inclusion. And that means, that means allowing the people to participate directly 
in the building of a society that responds to their most cherished needs and aspirations. And so we are moving along very well. And again, those are, those are the accomplishments that the sanctions yeah, are designed to try to destroy. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So let, let me um, ask you, so we've touched on um, education as well. I have to say with the roads, I mean, they really, it was fascinating to see the, to the reactions with that Facebook post. Everybody recognized so clearly how beautifully paved the roads are. Um, we've also touched on infrastructure, you know, regarding um, education. And can you tell us a little bit about the development of education? My understanding is that it very closely resembles um, the literacy project in Cuba, specifically the, the project developed in 1961 by the Cubans. And um, what is, is, is this the same or similar structure in getting education out of uh, you know, certain parts of municipalities, but out into, into rural communities as well? You will remember that Nicaragua carried out uh, the literacy campaign in 1980, that was one of the uh, one of the priority of the um, of the Sandinista revolution. In fact, in in all of the writings about the uh, the revolution, going all the way back to Sandino, they always emphasize the importance of educating the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the literacy campaign carried out in 1980, young people. Uh, went out and into the communities and lived and lived with the people teaching, mm. teaching the people to read and write. This was a tremendous accomplishment in the 1980 and was recognized by, the, by, the, uh, by UNESCO as one mm. of the most important uh, achievements in Latin America. When the Sandinistas lost the, uh, lost the election in 1990, and the neoliberal uh, group came into power and were in power for 16 years, one of the things that they did was to privatize education. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, public schools were no longer uh, uh, free of charge. And so when President Ortega came back to power, in the election of 2006, one of the priority immediately implemented was to restore free education throughout, throughout the country. And our strategy is to make education relevant that addresses the reality in which people, people actually live. That is key to bringing about a comprehensive yeah. uh, 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 educational uh, experience. And we have made great stride again, uh, re recovering what uh, the 16 years of neoliberal uh, policy yeah. had destroyed. But along with education, we also uh, reestablished free medical care and attention. And we established uh, models uh, and approaches, especially in the healthcare sector, that emphasizes uh, preventive uh, medicine. And that brings me to how we have been dealing with the, uh, the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the first things that Nicaragua did upon uh, learning that the World Health Organization had decreed a pandemic, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, one of the first things that we did was to activate our public, uh, family, uh, community, healthcare uh, model. Now, that is very important. Mm -hmm. It's very important because it involves the, the people of the community in, in, the, in, in preventive measures to ensure they are um, able to deal with, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, disasters that includes a possible uh, pandemic. 
Upon learning that the WHO had uh, alerted the, um, uh, had the, 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 the family community healthcare model, as I said, was immediately activated and they emphasized uh, um, implementation of all the protocols uh, um, that international and national protocols dealing with with with, uh, with uh, healthcare uh, uh, issues, they emphasize visiting the uh, families in their homes. More than four million homes were visited, uh, creating greater consciousness about the need to to wash hands, to use social distancing, to uh, to also um, uh, detect. Um, uh, suspicious cases, monitoring, use of masks, and so on and so forth. What is the purpose behind that? The purpose is behind that is to prevent, to ensure appropriate monitoring, contact, tracing, and so on and so forth. Also, you have a second step. When you have uh, suspicious cases, they, are, they have the possibility of being remitted to uh, mobile health clinics that are complementing the 19 hospitals that we have established throughout the country to take to care for uh, possible COVID-19 cases. These are some of the measures Nicaragua has taken internally. Also, we have taken steps to, um, to ensure that all of, the, um, all of the port of entries are duly equipped and manned in order to, with, with the necessary uh, equipment uh, and material to be able to uh, detect possible uh, suspicious cases of people entering the country. And we have done very well uh, with that. The third thing that we did was to, uh, was to uh, enter into agreements with governments, with the governments that border Nicaragua, Costa Rica in the south, and Nicaragua, uh, Honduras in the Honduras. north. The, we, these steps were taken to protect the, uh, the uh, uh, people, enter, uh, uh, to, to attend to people entering into the country so as to de detect uh, possible cases through temperature monitoring okay. and so on. And also um, uh, steps were taken to ensure that there would not be any illegal entries uh, into, the, into, the, into the country. Whenever anyone was, was detected uh, trying to enter into the country, they would be, uh, they would be uh, remitted to the appropriate authorities uh, for the necessary um, for the necessary monitoring as to uh, the possibility that they might be uh, that they might be uh, affected in some way by the by the virus and third and, 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 and thirdly um, we entered into I, I believe what are um, very very um, good cooperation agreement uh, with Cuba at the outset, uh, Taiwan, um, uh, South Korea, and um, just yesterday, um, we had a very, very uh, fruitful uh, exchange of, uh, uh, of best practices and experiences with India. Oh, wow. So, oh, okay. so um, uh, Nicaragua is, uh, is implementing its, uh, its uh, community, um, family uh, healthcare model. We believe that it is dealing with effectively with the um, with the, uh, the, the the pandemic. Like other countries, we have we have had our uh, share of cases, and we, um, we 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 know that we are going to be dealing with the with this um, this pandemic for, for for some time. But our model is a model that really is deeply rooted in the, the, uh, the idea of a public 
participation, mm -hmm. participatory democracy, people taking it on themselves to work together in, 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 in a fashion that ensures that we are able to take on the, 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 the uh, difficult challenges that might, that might come our way. It was natural for us when this pandemic was announced, it was natural for, for Nicaragua not to respond with alarm. Rather, what we did was what we would do in the event of any kind of uh, disaster. We train uh, yearly for, um, to deal with disasters. We carry out vaccination campaign all over the country every year. Uh, vaccine, vaccination against malaria, against dengue, against Zika, you name it. Yeah. Our public health care program is designed to deal with challenges such as COVID-19 without alarm, but with systematic attention. It's a really um, comprehensive, organized response. And um, it also says a lot about the population and how they feel about the, their government and how they feel about each other as a whole in, in saving one as in saving all. It's a communal, it's a communal response, which is something we do not see here in the States. And we could have a whole nother conversation about government institutions, U.S. culture and all of that. Um, but, you know, there's two things you mentioned regarding COVID-19, contact tracing and temperature reading. Here in the States, we've expanded testing. And so the number of cases discovered has gone up. And I would argue, you know, someone who is asymptomatic test positive, as does someone who is, you know, in the hospital, perhaps dying, that person tests positive as well. And there's no quantitative difference between the test results. And there's no, and, and there's no contact tracing here in the US. So it's confusing to a lot of us here to understand what the testing is being used for when there's no understanding where it's possibly spreading or where it's possibly come from. And the temperature reading is kind of a no brainer. I mean, you see that in many countries that, and you know, at the airports, you see people returning from Colombia to Venezuela at the border having temperature readings. It just seems very basic and um, logical and, and relatively inexpensive to do preventative measures such as that. And so we don't see any of that here. So I will um, when you are applaud you. When you're a poor country like us, you have to you have to emphasize a uh, preventive measure it is for us it's a no-brainer yeah you have to emphasize. it's also cost effective i mean <laughs> if you want to talk about it in capitalist terms such, such as the united states it's 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 more cost effective to prevent the illnesses that's correct that's that's yeah that's and we we have had good results by uh, with this approach and um, we have no reason uh, not to feel confident that it will it will uh, will it will be uh, successful interestingly enough you know when as soon as a, as a vaccine is found you know who in Nicaragua are going to be out there with these vaccines the Nicaraguan doctors, the Nicaraguan nurses, and the Nicaragua health workers in those brigades that are always out there every year vaccinating against, as I said, a dengue, malaria, you name it. They are going to be out there also applying uh, a vaccine when it, uh, when it is discovered. In the meantime, we continue with the, uh, all the preventive measures encouraging washing of hands, use of glove, social distancing, and so on and so forth. So listening to this fantastic proactive approach to this pandemic, I wonder if you can comment a bit on this article yesterday, two days ago in the Washington Post, 
really um, that was about what were what's now being labeled in the United States as these express burials. Is there, can you give us a little insight as to what that article is really about, perhaps? Well, I, I know what the article is about. <laughs> it's a way of trying to discredit uh, the, 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 the good things that we, that we have been doing. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, um, when someone, given the, 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 the reality of a, uh, of, of COVID-19, part of the um, preventive measures is to uh, 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 provide for the burial of, of, of individuals to avoid um, a large grouping of people and also to avoid possible propagation. I've seen that, I've seen that being done here in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, in, other parts of, in other parts of the world, some places with, uh, with uh, uh, greater um, um, uh, amounts than, uh, than you would see in, in Nicaragua. But it's part, of the, it's part of the strategy of dealing with, um, part of the strategy of dealing with the, the, the effects of, of COVID-19. You it's a containment. It's a containment practice. Well, yes, and yeah. I suppose the, the, the Washington Post in its article, uh, they try to give it some kind of a, a, some kind of a mysterious uh, 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 connotation when in fact uh, they, they, they ought to know that these are part of the, of, of the strategy of the impl being implemented by the government to, to deal with the, uh, to avoid propagation of, um, of, uh, of, of, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Well, you know, we do, we do hear that that's how the Chinese government um, in many cases handled containment. And we're also starting to hear how perhaps New York City is managing um, containment. Sure. And so, um, yeah, we'll have we'll have to see what more comes from our own country and how we're. But thank you for sharing that with us. You know, um, I promised you no more than an hour, and we're approaching um, fifty-five minutes to two. Is there anything that um, you would like to add today today's conversation that we've not touched on? Well, not really. But um, I, what I would say is that in. Uh, in dealing with the um, with the, the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, international solidarity is of fundamental importance. Uh, countries need to uh, to work together in in dealing with this uh, this uh, this uh, pandemic that knows no does not respect nat national boundaries or uh, ideologies. Uh, it is imper it's imperative that uh, we, uh, that we work together, that we uh, uh, seek for best practices, and that um, we um, understand that each country might have to apply its own strategy. And that strategy, in order to be successful, has to be based on the reality of, of, the, of the country. You cannot dictate from outside how a, a country is to be able to um, uh, address this, um, this, 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 this major threat. In Nicaragua, we are applying our uh, participatory democracy strategy. That means that the people participate directly in the defense of their, their lives, in the defense of their, um, of their uh, rights to, to build um, a society that is uh, responsive to their, um, to, to their uh, needs and, and uh, uh, aspiration. And most important, sectors that continue to try to undermine and deny countries the right of sovereignty and the rights of self-determination 
should really set aside these destructive uh, uh, policies and allow each country to deal with this pandemic in such a way that it helps to build rather than, 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 than destroy. And I come back to what I said at the outset, sanctions, sanctions are designed to destroy. Sanctions are designed to destabilize. Sanctions are designed to demoralize. Sanctions are designed to deny uh, peoples in smaller countries, especially the right to self-determination. I, a, a few weeks ago, or maybe two weeks ago, I participated in a, in a, in a seminar uh, that was called Sanctions Kills. And oh yes, you were one of our panelists. It was a week ago, Saturday. Uh, yes, yeah. and you were a very, very good uh, way of describing it. Um, you have people who want to give you all kinds of sophisticated interpretation about uh, the, uh, sanctions and the purpose of sanctions. But the bottom line is sanctions are, dis are designed to destroy. Sanctions are, are designed to kill. San san uh, sanctions are designed to inflict pain and suffering. Sanctions are immoral. They are a form of aggression that are contrary to international law. They are contrary to the Charter of the United Nations, and they are contrary, contrary to, the, to the principle of peaceful coexistence that should exist, uh, that should exist between, uh, between countries. So I want to call on uh, all of uh, the, uh, the solidarity groups in the United States and abroad to join forces to put an end to these Ill illegal sanctions. As I said earlier as well, in the, 19, in, 19, in the 1980s, the United States government imposed all kinds of sanctions against Nicaragua, trying to destroy the Sandinista, destroy the Sandinista revolution. And uh, th those, uh, those actions included uh, promotion of uh, terrorism, state-sponsored terrorism against Nicaragua. And the World Court in 1986 ruled in favor of Nicaragua when it condemned the United States for state-sponsored terrorism in Nicaragua. That is a fact. You have people who might not want to recognize it, <laughs> but it is a fact. You check the the, the uh, website of the International Court of Justice in June 1986, and you will find the ruling of the court that the United States was guilty of state-sponsored state terrorism against Nicaragua. If I'm not mistaken, the only country that has been declared, uh, are, that has been condemned for state-sponsored terrorism. The only country yes, they... in the world. It's fascinating, isn't it? When you look at, you know, what the government here says about other countries, <laughs> and most recently, you know, well, consistently Iran and, and Cuba and, and now Venezuela too. It, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's fascinating. And it's so, um, it's frustrating to a lot of us here in the States, but it's why it's so important for us to be able to talk with people such as you. And I so, value, appreciate um, your giving us this hour for this conversation. It's been extraordinarily um, educational and beneficial, and I hope that we can do it again. I look forward <laughs> to that. And uh, once again, I thank you for your, your solidarity. I thank you for your support, and we will continue to talk. I look forward to it. Okay. So everyone, I just want to, again, let you know, we have spent the hour talking with Francisco Campbell. He's the Nicaragua ambassador to the United States. We've been in conversation 
with him today from the embassy in Washington, D.C. Um, please be sure to watch our What the F is Going On in Latin America weekly webinar series every 9 a.m. Uh, every Wednesday, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. And also should let all of you know, we do uh, air Code Pink Radio on Thursdays, 11 a.m. At 11 a.m. Eastern, and that's on WPFW Washington, D.C., simulcasted on WBAI in New York City. So, Mr. Ambassador, maybe you can join us on the air one of these days as well, <laughs> So, on the radio. So, everyone, thank you so much, and really an honor and a pleasure, Mr. Ambassador, to have um, this hour-long conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.